Day, Chapter 30, Finding Baby. Daddy's still at work. Mama and Dylan walked over to the library for afternoon story time. I really like going to the library, but I didn't go. Right now, I have to take advantage of not being in school because of the snow and concentrate on finding baby. I'll sure be adding snow days to my grateful list tonight. Karina and Daria sit cross-legged on my bed. I'm praying they don't smell the pee accident that Dylan had the other night. Karina turns the silver key over and over in her hand. She holds it up to the light. I'm pretty sure this is a locker key, she says. She looks at the engraving on the key. CWS3, number 25, she reads out loud. I'm not sure what CWS3 stands for, she says, but 25 must be the locker number. I wonder what's in there, I say. Karina shrugs. She raises one dark eyebrow. Who knows? Maybe nothing, or maybe something that will tell us more about her. At least we know her name is, her last name is Knight, Daria says. That's a big help. Daria frowns over Jewel's small leather book. She's writing something down on a piece of paper. She grabs the end of her thick black braid and chews on it. The addresses in the book are from all over the place. Oregon, Denver, even St. Louis. So I can't tell where she lived before she and baby ended up here. Dang. But, she continues, holding up her pencil, she does say that she has to call Lexington Power and Light. Isn't Lexington in Kentucky? I ask. Daria nods. I think so, but we need to check it on the computer. Let's go down to the resource room. Karina says, if we're lucky, one of the computers will be free. Luck is with us. Someone is just leaving a computer when we get there. Daria logs on. She types in the words, Lexington. We watch the screen. Daria worries the end of her braid while we wait, just like Mama does. Wow, Karina says, shaking her head. Who knew so many places are named Lexington? Double dang. Then an idea flickers in my brain like a firefly. What if you search the name of the electric company? Darius' fl fingers flash over the keyboard. Bingo, she says with a grin. Piper, you're a genius. That electric company is in Lexington, Kentucky. Let me tell you, huh, nobody has ever accused me of being a genius. That's a long ways away from here, almost as far as where we came from in Louisiana, I say. Wonder why she came all this way, Daria says. And how, I add. Does she have family here or nearby, Karina wonders aloud. Could that be why she came here? But then, why would she and baby be living in the park? Daria says. We stare at the computer screen like it'll magically tell us more. It doesn't. Just then, Karina's mom pops her head into the room. Ah, there you are, she says. I've been looking all over for you. The brownies have arrived. I need your help unloading the boxes. Firefly Gourmet Brownies. We shut down the computer and follow Mrs. Bailey out to her old beat up Ford Fiesta, otherwise known as Henry. <laughs> we carry box after box of butter crunch blondies, raspberry swirls, chocolates, mocha mint, peanut butter supremes, caramel dreams, and my favorite, pistachio surprise. Just as I'm about to pick up the last few boxes, I hear someone breathing hard behind me. I whirl around. It's Ree and Ajax. Ree pants like she's just run a marathon. She bends over with her hands on her knees. Ajax licks her face. Oh, Lordy, she mutters. I got to give up the cigs. Finally, 
She straightens up and looks at me. I shiver at the look in her eyes. Fear. It's about baby. My heart drops like a rock into a deep, dark well. Ree tell us, tells us a story. An improbable, I know vocabulary word, story. Somehow, some way, baby went all the way across the city and found the hospital, hospital where Jewel is. He almost found her too. But animal control found him first and took him away. Idiots! Ray waves her arms like windmills and paces in tight circles. Ajax whimpers. People step into the street to avoid her. I don't blame them. All he wanted was to find Jewel, and what do they do? Ray demands. Karina and Daria watch Ray, wide-eyed. I can't answer because my heart is one big knot in my throat. They lock him up like a common criminal and haul him away. Ree spits. She jabs a finger in the air and says, This is exactly why I hate people. Where did they take him? I managed to speak. The so-called humane society, Ree says. The pound, Karina whispers. My heart drops. I remember the pound in Cypress Point. It was not... Exactly humane. I grab Ree's sleeve. She jerks her arm away. Ree does not like to be touched. You're going to get baby back, aren't you? I ask. Ree runs her hand across her face and then her shoulders slump. I can't. Now it's my turn to wave my arms. What do you mean you can't? I can't take Ajax on the bus, Piper. But can't Linda look after him? Ree snorts. Huh, I haven't seen Linda for a couple of days. I don't even know where she is. By the time I find her and catch a bus that goes to the east part of the city, the shelter would be closed. It closes at five. I didn't think about that. I look at my watch. 4.15. But maybe uh, I start. And even if I could somehow magically take Ajax on the bus, I won't take him anywhere near that place. They hate street people with dogs. If they had their way, and she is off on another tear. Just then, Mrs. Bailey comes out to move her car. She stops dead in her tracks and quickly takes in the scene on the sidewalk. Her eyes narrow, her fists punch into her hips. What's going on here? I take a deep breath and plunge into the story of Baby and Jewel. Toward the end of my telling, Mama and Dylan come back from the library. Dylan waves at Ree. Hi, lady, he says with a big smile. Is this about Baby? Mama asks. When Mama hears about Baby finding his way back to the hospital and being taken away by animal control, she shakes her head. Lord, Lord, what are we going to do, Mama? I ask. I don't know what we can do, Piper, but they might kill him, Mama. No, Dylan wails. They can't kill Toto, which starts Ajax howling and re cussing up a storm and Mama trying to quiet Dylan down. Everybody calm down. Mrs. Bailey holds up her hands like she's trying to stop a freight train. Now, she says, pointing at Ree, did they tell you at the hospital which humane society they took this lady's dog to? Ree nods. She pulls her sleeve up and shows the inside of her arm to Mrs. Bailey. I wrote down the address. She nods. Did you tell them that the dog belongs to a patient in their hospital? Ree shrugs. I tried to, but well, I got pretty upset and her voice trails off. Mrs. Bailey turns to Karina. Go get my purse. She points again at Ree. You, you're coming with me so we can get this straightened out. Before Ree can go into all the reasons she can't, I say, Mrs. Bailey, I don't think that would be the best idea. She studies Ree. Probably not. She eyes me for a second and then says, you know the whole story, don't you? 
I nod, pretty much. She looks at Mama. Is it okay if I take Piper with me to the animal shelter so she can explain the situation? Dylan jumps up and down. Bring Toto here. He can live with us, right, Mama? I look at Mama too, hoping against hope. Both Mama and Mrs. Bailey shake their heads. Dogs aren't allowed here, Piper, Mama says. But he's so little, I say. I bet no one would even notice him. I'd share all my food with him and... I see Mama set her jaw. Absolutely not. If they found out we had a dog, we'd be right back out on the streets. I look at Mrs. Bailey with puppy dog eyes. She sighs. Your mother's right, Piper. Karina comes out and hands her mother her purse. Mrs. Bailey fishes out pen and paper. Show me that address again. She reads the address off Ree's arm and writes it down on a piece of paper. She snaps her purse shut. She looks at her watch. Come on, Miss Popper, she says, opening the passenger door of Henry. We need to go on a fact-finding mission before that animal shelter closes. Suddenly, I remember something. Hang on just a second, I say, and I race to my room. We go up one street and then down another. I see Jerry and his cat, Lucky, sitting in the doorway of an empty store. Some people in fancy clothing are smiling, talking to him and stroking Lucky. A little farther on, I see a guy I recognize from the park and his two little dogs. The dogs are bundled up in coats. He's holding a cardboard sign. Mrs. B stops for a red light. She shakes her head and says, I like dogs a lot too. And I guess I understand that they're all these folks have, but I just don't think I'd give up living inside with a roof over my head for one. I think about something Linda told me the other day at the park when I was looking for Ree. I say to Mrs. B, when people see them on the street with their dog or cat, I wanna make sure I include Lucky. <laughs> They aren't just street people. They're real people. Most everybody can relate to having a pet they love. Having their dog or cat helps them feel like they're important, even if it's just to their dog. I think some more on what Linda said. I wanna make Mrs. B understand. Linda says everybody needs another heartbeat on their side. Mrs. Bailey nods. The light turns green. You've given me something to think about, Piper. Finally, we pull into the parking lot of East Valley Humane Society. It's not a dark little cinder block building like the one in Cypress Point. This one is big and has lots of windows. As soon as we get to the front door though, I hear the howls and yelps and yips of desperate dogs. Is babies one of those voices? We walk into the brightly, brightly lit lobby. It's clean, but still smells a little like pee and pine salt. <laughs> what can I help you with? A woman at the desk asks. She has blue streaks in her dark hair and a pierced nose. Do you have a little dog here you picked up from Mercy Memorial Hospital this morning? Mrs. B asks. The woman nods. Oh, yes. It's not every day you get a call that a dog is running loose inside a hospital. She frowns just a little. Is he yours? No, Mrs. B says, but we do know who he belongs to. She's a patient at Mercy Hospital, I say. He was trying to find her. That's sad, she says. Can you keep him until she gets out of the hospital? Mrs. B and I look at each other and she says, I'm afraid that's not possible. The woman, her name tag says Tamara, studies us for just a minute too long. Does she see the frayed collar of Mrs. B's coat and the purse strap held together by duct tape? Does she see the one room I share with my little brother and mother and father? Are we somehow branded as homeless? Finally, she asks, when will his owner be out of the hospital? Do you know? We shake our heads. Soon, I say, hopefully. And when she does get out of the hospital, do they have a home? My stomach knots up, she knows. <laughs> we shake our heads again. T 
camera size, we can hold him for two weeks. After that, he'll be put up for adoption. But you can't, I say. Baby is all Jewel has in this world. Tamara smiles. Is that his name? Baby? Her eyes soften. Look, Baby will get very good care while he's here. Plenty of food and a bed to sleep in. We'll give him a bath and get him all up to date on his shots. I guess that all sounds good until she says he'll actually be better off here than living on the streets with his owner. Being homeless is no way for any dog to live. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm channeling Re. I don't care if this lady has figured out we live in a shelter. We're here to help baby. I pull myself up tall and I say, just because a person doesn't have a home to live in doesn't mean they don't love their dog or cat as much as someone who lives in a fancy house. And just because they live in the park, that doesn't mean Jewel isn't somebody. She is and baby needs her. Mrs. Bailey puts her hand on my shoulder and squeezes. I can feel the blood pounding in my ears. Tamara smooths some papers on her desk. She nods. I understand. She steps out from behind her desk and smiles. Would you like to see him? <laughs> my heart lifts up. Yes, ma'am. I sure would. Mrs. B and I follow Tamara down a long hall through the cat room. So many kittens. And through a door to the kennels. Row after row of big dogs, small dogs, some jumping up against the chain link wire cages, others sleeping or huddled in the corner. Some look hopeful. Some look like they've given up all hope of anything good ever happening again. I want every one of these dogs. Here we are, Tamara says, stopping next to a kennel at the end. I peer into the dark. It takes me a second to see Baby curled up on a blanket in the corner. His food and water look untouched. He's trembling. I kneel down and call to him softly. Baby, come here, baby. He lifts his head and whimpers uncertainly. Come here, baby, I call again. I put my fingers through the wire so he can smell me. Ree says dogs remember everything through scent. Sure enough, he comes slowly, timidly, over and sniffs my fingers. Then he wags his little bit of a tail. I just about burst into tears. Hi, baby, I managed to get out. Hi, sweet boy. You can go in and sit with him for a minute if you want, Tamara offers. She opens the door and I scoot in, sit cross-legged on the cold concrete floor and take him into my lap. He covers my face with kisses. I'll wait for you in the lobby, Piper, Miss B says. Just a minute, though. We need to get back. After Mrs. Bailey and Tamara leave, I hold baby close and whisper in his soft little ear, I will find a way for you and Jewel to be together again. I rock him just a little and stroke his back. I can feel the knobby bones of his spine through his fur. I don't know how I'm going to do it, baby. But you've done so much good for me. It's the least I can do. But how? I'm just a kid. Baby sniffs my coat pocket and wags his stuffy, stubby tail. I almost forgot. I pull out the little toy rabbit we found in Jewel's bag. Here you go, buddy. Gently, he takes the little bunny and licks it over and over. Baby wags his tail and looks at me like I can do anything. There's not one speck of doubt in that furry little face. Only trust.